So hello and welcome to Making the Invisible Visible, Mapping Extreme Heat Across Salt Lake City. My name is Ellen Erickson. I'm the manager of citizen science programs here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. The mission of the museum is to illuminate the natural world and the place of humans within it. And our citizen science programs connect humans with active science, putting the community at the center of scientific conversation. Citizen Science at NHMU is powered by you, the community. And we're so grateful to the members of the community who take part in our wide variety of programming, uh, ranging from collecting data on squirrels to looking for fireflies across Utah, to helping us make iNaturalist observations or extract DNA from insects. We've got something for everybody. So I hope uh, and encourage you uh, to join us in the future. Visit the museum's webpage for more info on our current offerings. NHMU is also proud to announce that we're uh, starting a new permanent exhibition um, that's gonna be launched to the public this upcoming week. It's being finalized right now, just outside these doors. You walked by it on your way into this room, um, a climate of hope. This landmark exhibition is designed to help Utahns find opportunity in the face of climate crisis, exploring emotions around climate change and the power of taking action, especially working with others as a way to feel more hopeful about our future. We're thrilled to have you all here today at the museum. We hope that you find some illumination as we explore um, our topic for this presentation today, a campaign that included community engagement this summer, the 2023 heat mapping report of Salt Lake City. This event brings together local scientists, managers, policymakers, and community members as we explore the implications of the heat map report and discuss extreme heat as a public health concern. This collaborative presentation is being put on in partnership with the Utah Climate Center at Utah State University, Utah State University's Landscape, Architecture, and Environmental Planning Department, Salt Lake City, Roland Hall, and the Natural History Museum of Utah. We're also joined by community partners with Tree Utah, Heal Utah, SLC Green, and the University of Utah Wilkes Center. The research presented to you today was funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and Kappa Heat Strategies. We also feel it's important as we gather here today to honor Utah's first peoples with a land acknowledgement that was written in collaboration with tribal leaders, and uh, they encourage us to continue reading this acknowledgement during public events. The Natural History Museum of Utah, or the Natural History Museum is part of the University of Utah, who acknowledges the Salt Lake Valley has always been a gathering place for indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. We also want to highlight one of the ways that NHMU has taken action to back these words. Also just outside these doors is the museum's Native Voices Gallery. This exhibition was designed in consultation with Utah's indigenous communities and interprets the deep memory and contemporary presence of Utah's indigenous people. I encourage you to visit that gallery um, after you leave this presentation too. During today's event, if you need any drinking water or the restroom, you'll find both of those over by the elevators on the north side of the building where you came up um, to this level. Today, you'll be hearing from five different speakers. Each one is dedicated to climate research, education, and action here in Utah. We'll have time for questions for all presenters at the end of our session here together. So kindly hold questions until we've heard from all of our speakers. First, I'd like to invite our, well, I'd like to invite our, our first speaker up here to the front of the podium who will provide some context on climate change and extreme heat in Utah. Please join me in welcoming Director of the Utah Climate Center at Utah State University and the state climatologist, Dr. Robert Gillis.
Are you sure? Space. Space. Not working. <laughs> I was doing. Does this one Okay. Okay. So this is not mine. This is yours. That's mine. <laughs> now I'm ready. Well, thank you for being here on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm originally from Scotland, and today is a fairly ominous day in the UK. It's actually Guy Fox Day. I don't know if you've heard of Guy Fox. Anyway, they're having a whale of a time over there, I'm sure. Okay, so I am the director of the Utah Climate Center, and it's a state-funded center whose mission is to facilitate access to climate data and information and to use expertise in atmospheric science to interpret climate information in an accurate and innovation manner or fashion specifically for the public. So this is our website here. Um, it's just simply climate.usu.edu. So this actually came out this year, which is the change in mean winter temperature from 1970 to 2023 and as you can see it's quite a sobering picture um, in more ways than one so our winters are becoming significantly warmer certainly from 1970 to present if you sort of average it <clears throat> in the winter there's been uh, an increase of about 3.2 degrees fahrenheit and in the summer yeah, less so, but still significant at 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit. With that in mind, okay, um, we wrote a paper back in 2012, and it was published in the Journal of Climate, and the conclusions at that time were winter maximum and minimum temperatures were increasing over time, winter precipitation was increasing, believe it or not, in northern Utah. But of that increase, the winter regime was changing from snow to rain. And the interesting thing about it all, even though we were getting more precip in northern Utah, there were fewer storms. So the implication that you take from that was the storms were more, or are becoming more intense. Okay. I asked my staff and postdocs in the Climate Center to redo this analysis. It's out for review at the moment, but what happened when we uh, redid that analysis? So as far as the winter max and min temperatures increasing over time, it is still the case. As far as winter precipitation increasing in northern Utah, it's not the case. So that trend has changed. The winter regime is definitely changing from snow to rain, same conclusion there. And finally, fewer storms implied more storms are intense. It was the case there. So pretty much the trends are pretty solid from the initial analysis and of course the more recent analysis, which we hope to get published, but you never know. Reviewers can be very fickle, <laughs> let me tell you. Sometimes you just have to take a paper and put it in a drawer and leave it for two weeks before you reply to the reviews. <laughs> Ten years ago, we found that over the last half century, Utah's wintertime precipitation was changing pretty dramatically. Intuitively so, with the warming climate, our snowpack season is being reduced on both ends. So it's arriving later in the fall and ending earlier in the spring. Counterintuitively though, we found we were actually seeing more water being delivered through the wintertime months. So we revisited this study and we found that we now are seeing increasingly dangerous trends towards less precipitation overall. So the trends that we were seeing of better precipitation in the wintertime months has reversed. We're now seeing less precipitation and we're seeing greater amounts of it arriving in the form of rainfall, which when you have a snowpack and it's raining on top of that can really supercharge the problem of snowpack collapse. Well, when we look forward in time, the biggest key 
takeaway that we're finding right now is this expectation for these trends to continue to get worse. We see the same thing with snow, like March and November are seeing the greatest reduction in snow. The impacts and effects that we're seeing to our snowpack, to our annual water budget, have just really begun. The, the changes and the impacts in northern Utah are the most apparent and we expect to see these trends continue with less and less available snowpack in the times that we've grown to be accustomed to the available water. And so this very much is a red flag looking forward into our water supply. So that was John just summarizing what I had said previously, but he was much better, yeah? <laughs> Here's actually some of the results here, but since it's all about, um, well, this uh, workshop is all about uh, urban heat islands, we just focus up here. You can see what's happening uh, as far as average temperature is concerned. So that's part of the results there. The rest, I won't bother to discuss. You can actually animate this quite nicely, or I have done so in the past. This was something that was prepared by my colleague, Rob Davies, uh, up at USU as a physicist. And we were looking, we had a really good data set from Utah, to, uh, well, Tooele, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, in Utah. <clears throat> so let's look at what's happened over uh, a long period of observations. So this is the number of days, okay, where this the distri the, the sorry shall we say the, the distribution of summer temperature in the 1960s, and then that's the mean just to give you a reference point, and that's the maximum. If we then go into the 2000s you can see how the distribution has shifted. The mean has shifted as well as the maximum. But there's other ways to look at this. So we're looking at decade now, okay? The scale is gone, not sure why that is the case, but this is the distribution from Three minutes, I'll be gone, don't worry. <laughs> so these are the number of days over the 1900s. So it goes, so they got, let's see, I'll say 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110. So this is a long data set. So this was the days above 90 degrees. This is how it was 95 degrees. 100 degrees. So these are the number of times that you exceeded or reached those temperatures. So in that period there, over 100 years, okay, we had 66 days above 100 degrees. And we had 94 degrees above 100 degrees. If we then look at 101, 102, 103, so in this whole period of 100 years, okay, we had four days above 103, whereas in the most recent decade, we had 28 days above 103. So that's just an animated way of looking at how our temperatures have shifted. And of course, the climate is basically a magnifier of whatever is on the ground. So if you have a, an urban heat island uh, occurring Okay, this is just magnifying that effect. This is another trend, it's called the alligator trend. And basically, it's a pretty busy picture, but if you look at the red lines, the bottom line is that the season of summer temperatures is expanding into spring and fall. So getting a longer warm season, uh, and that essentially extends the, herb, the urban heat island issue. Okay, and I believe I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Gillis. And now, well, let's see, next we're going to hear from the company that's been helping cities around the globe conduct heat mapping projects. Please welcome manager at Kappa Strategies LLC, Joey Williams. All right. 
Thank you for that introduction and hi everyone. Nice to see you all here. My name is Joey Williams and where are we at? Here we go. Um, my name is Joey Williams and I'm here representing Kappa Strategies, which is a planning analytics adaptation and planning firm out of Portland, Oregon. Um, I had the good coincidence of being here uh, the past few months and over the summer during the campaign, uh, moved here for the year with my partner, Celia and had good timing to uh, be able to support the campaign locally. Uh, Kappa, we are a, a urban planning and climate adaptation firm. We have been uh, supporting these efforts in urban heat island mapping around the country for about five or six years now. Um, and my role primarily has been as an administrator of that program. We've conducted this style of campaign of engaging volunteers from the community, forming partnerships with local groups in over 100 cities across the US and now around the world. And this has been supported from NOAA and within NOAA, the Climate Program Office. And we work directly with this group, the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, or NIHIS. And their interest has been not only to get a better grasp on how is heat distributed across our cities in the United States, but also how can we better engage community around these issues of rising temperatures, and as Dr. Gilly has pointed out, very concerning number of hot days throughout the year. And while these each city here presents a, a unique landscape and a unique picture of heat, we see a lot of common threads and I'm very encouraged to see the attention on these different themes as presented with these great student projects in the back of the um, auditorium here showing really common themes uh, that are really important to, to think about when we talk about urban heat at this level. Topography, athletics, redlining, air pollution, um, heat index, how real fuel affects people, you know, these are issues that we see commonly throughout the cities. And while in Portland, Oregon, we're in the Northwest, sounds much cooler, we, we see these same kind of themes come up. And so I'm, I'm really encouraged to, to see the level of depth that this understanding is, uh, of understanding that is growing here, um, especially with the, the youth who are engaged on the campaign. Uh, we this year conducted the urban heat island mapping campaign in 15 locations across the US. Um, so you can see here we had a little bit of a Western cohort in uh, the Northwest, Salt Lake, Sedona, and we were putting our heads together to plan this very kind of logistics heavy event of getting people out and collecting data at one single time. And we do this to increase our kind of resolution, our our scale of understanding of the distribution of urban heat. Um, and we also do this to get people to build that awareness around the issue in these, these multiple dimensions. So I've been asked here to, to, to talk about two main components here, uh, this campaign from the national level, um, and also to give you a little bit more of a picture of the analysis that uh, Kappa Strategies does in using the data to create these maps. Um, so on the national level, you know, we saw engagement from communities all across the US, not just students like we had a great show up from here, but fire departments, um, we had, uh, we had gardener, master gardener groups, we had public health officials, urban planners, uh, we had pets right in ride alongs. Um, so all focused on this, uh, on this effort to get a better grasp on heat. So the other part I've been asked to speak a little bit about is how we get from these maps of all the traverse points that people collected to this area wide map that you see on a lot of these posters back here. So I want to highlight one real strength of uh, how this campaign was pulled off. It is impossible to collect these many measurements across the city at one time without the participation and willing energy of community participants. So that's one real strength of this, this approach is because of the interest of, of folks like you all, we're able to get out and collect these simultaneous measurements of temperature across a large city like this at one time. 
And then to get to these maps, I want to just kind of overview some of this, and you can ask me questions on this later if you're more interested in the analytical methods or how to make interpretations or meaning out of this. But basically, we get the data back, and you'll hear more about how that data was collected. We look at a few different experimental controls. So we want to make sure the data was collected on kind of an even playing field where we can ensure that we got the most accurate measurements during the, during the periods of uh, data collection. We then use that data and integrate uh, multispectral imagery from the Sentinel-2 satellite in order to understand what's the relationship between those measurements of temperature and what was happening on the ground in terms of the land cover. And that I mean, was a cooler measurement made near a mix of a park and maybe a water body? Uh, or was a hotter measurement collected maybe near a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of tree cover and it has a lot of parking lots and impervious surfaces as we call them. And using this picture of the land covers across the entire city, we can correlate those measurements that were gathered in order to make these predicted models across the entire area. So there's a few more steps in there, but I don't wanna bore you all. Um, this is just to say, this is a, a method that we've uh, launched across many different locations. And we see the value, not just in the data products of collecting the temperature measurements and making these models, but we see them be applied in a lot of different ways by city planners, by um, health officials, by you know regional, uh, gatherers and, and nonprofits, people who are in, in, interested in identifying where can we plant more trees to mitigate this urban heat island? How does this link to health? What are the places that are most vulnerable, vulnerable based on these histories of things like redlining and identity? Um, but of course, we're also seeing these great out outcomes from the engagement process. So new partnerships formed, conversations like these happening, attention on the issue, um, and understanding its implications. And so really just by attending here, learning about this and, and what's happening in your community, this is a big part of the, the reach of what we're hoping to do. And I just wanna say thanks for being here and, and thanks for um, participating in this. These are a couple other examples, but I'm over time here, so I'll just pass on to the next person. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Joey. Uh, and now to dive into the Salt Lake heat mapping campaign project, please welcome coordinator of climate studies at Roland Hall, Rob Wilson. I wanna thank everyone again for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. What a great venue for this. And I wanna make sure to thank all the volunteers who made this possible. It was a, a great campaign day in July when we collected this data. I'd like to share with you some interpretation of the maps and just show them to you so that you can interpret them on your own. All there is to thinking is seeing something noticeable, which makes you see something you weren't noticing, which makes you see something that isn't even visible. That's Norman McLean from A River Runs Through It. And it's also the thought process that led to our results. Because you can't see the heat. You can see its consequences and maybe its sources. So I'd like to introduce the thermal environment, which you're aware of by inhabiting your body, but maybe you haven't thought about its components. As you're out about, so here's a person on a sidewalk and evaporation from a sweat, the human body has a phenomenal ability to thermoregulate by perspiration. In radiation, this arrow, being a good teacher, I brought my laser pointer right here. Infrared radiation. So you feel that as heat. You feel that as heat by a campfire when the air between you and the campfire is warm, but that infrared heat is warming your body. And then you turn around and it warms your back. And that comes and goes from the body. It's a two-way transaction. And convection is the breeze that maybe gives you goosebumps if you get out of a swimming pool. And conduction is when you put your hand against a surface. And if it's a, if it's a playground bar in the summertime, that surface is hot. You feel convection. 
And then sunlight, of course, direct sunlight and reflected sunlight. And this is how we experience the thermal environment. It's not just the air temperature. It's not just being in the sun or the shade. It's a combination of factors. And this is every day, but as temperatures get extreme, it can become dangerous. And now an introduction to the urban heat island effect. I think this has already been referenced before. And this is really um, central to what we are attempting to measure in Salt Lake City. What we have here are daylight air temperatures and surface temperatures. So the surface temperatures are the solid lines and the air temperature are dashed and then nighttime. And this is a, a hypothetical example, but you can see as it approaches uh, an urban center, you've got cooler temperatures and then they rise at night. So if you picture a shoreline here, our heat island is that above average temperature or temperature above the surroundings. And I want to bring your attention to those nighttime temperatures, especially because it's when the body doesn't get relief from the heat that it becomes most dangerous. You've all, I imagine, experienced some, some activity where you got too hot, you were out gardening or playing tennis or doing some activity and you got too hot. And that's a more acute situation, but the chronic heat exposure is what we're seeing is really dangerous in our cities. And the chronic happens when you can't escape it during the day. And mostly you have the chance to escape it at night, but if where you're living doesn't cool down at night, then there's no escape from the heat. Joey just introduced our transects. Here are 10. So on July 15th, we ran 10 transects at three times of day, at 6 to 7 a.m., 3 to 4 p.m., and 7 to 8 p.m. And that allowed us to compare each of the 10 transects amongst each other for the same time period or um, any comparison across the time periods. From that, and Joey just explained how we generated these maps, but this is where the heat becomes really visible. I highlighted for you Liberty Park in green to help you um, get oriented. And you can see the I-15 corridor. This is the afternoon. And then the evening, it's cooled down a little bit and the heat's really dispersed. There's a little bit uh, hotter region around the I-15 corridor, a little bit near city center, but the heat's quite dispersed. And what I've been looking most closely at are uh, the measurements from the morning transects, the 6 to 7 a.m. Because what this reveals is the areas that didn't cool down as much. This reveals the areas that would have been hotter at night. And this was a hot July day, but it was not extreme. The, the highs were in the mid 90s on that day. So it was sort of average July heat for Salt Lake City. But if you imagine this, if it were a high temperature of 107, what's it like in these neighborhoods that don't cool down as much? And you can see these really distinct differences along the I-15 corridor. My pointer's being a little fussy here. The I-15 corridor and then Poplar Grove um, between I-15 and 215, then pretty hot in the city center area. And then some hot pockets on the east side. This is the University of Utah Central Campus in Foothill Boulevard. So I was interested in looking at how these correlate with other maps, what, what um, overlays might reveal so this is a topographic map. And downtown is around uh, 4,300 feet in elevation, and central campus is around 4,800 feet, so you've got about 500 feet. And as anyone who's driven up one of our canyons knows, that it cools down as you go up in elevation. And that's not a lot, but it could be enough for cooler temperatures. However, we definitely saw a distinct heat island around Salt Lake, around the central campus and foothill areas. So topography does not explain 
the distribution of heat. This is a tree canopy map. So this is a measurement of the number of trees in the neighborhood based on the potential canopy because you've got streets and net buildings. And so it's not gonna be a, a forest like you. So no primordial forest here, but we've got an urban forest. And the east side neighborhoods are at or very near 100% potential canopy. And starting around State Street, Here, you've got less than 100% canopy. So this is the ballpark neighborhood that I put in pink for you there. And that correlates better with this. You see the neighborhoods with less tree canopy, uh, hotter temperatures. And this neighborhood is revealing here because it's got pretty good tree canopy. And you can see that present here. It's got pretty good tree canopy, so it's cooler. And congratulations to the city and thank you to the city for for advocating and planting an urban forest for us and all the neighbors who take care of their urban trees. And another map that I've been really interested in are the historic redlining maps. So a little background on redlining. It's it describes um, a neighborhood investment practice uh, from the homeowners loan corporation, which was a new deal program. And so it was a really active program in the 1930s. And it was a way of evaluating the investment risk in a neighborhood because a banker is, is for good reasons, interested in the risk of a mortgage and other neighborhood investment. And for hundreds of cities in the United States, they ranked neighborhoods according to um, risk. And they ranked them like a school report card, A, B, C, D, or F. I think that's kind of funny how they gave us the same grades. And then they color coded their maps. So a green, a green um, zone is an A grade. So that was considered very low risk. It was a, a good investment. B was um, a little more risky, but still a safe investment. C was considered declining. And a D is a hazardous, a high risk. And you can see a sharp divide in Salt Lake City. The east side neighborhoods are blue and green, and the west side neighborhoods are red. And this is the original map that they digitized at this site. If you're interested in future looking at it later today or later time, social vulnerability and the legacy of redlining. And that correlates so well with our other maps. Here's the ballpark neighborhood. Here's Liberty Park. We had the cooler regions. A little bit east of State Street in the hotter regions right in here. The ballpark's really hot. And the redlining is connected to social vulnerability. So what, um, what the people at Not Even Past have done is they've taken the redlining maps and they've drawn a sort of, not exactly, um, they've, they've drawn a comparison between maps generated for the redlining program in the 30s to social vulnerability um, based on data from the 2010 census. And the vulnerability takes in a number of factors. Uh, it looks at average age, it looks at demographics, it looks at the frequency of disease, it looks at the exposure to hazards, and it ranks it on a scale of zero to one. And it looks like this. So I shared with you the, the social vulnerability scores from the ballpark neighborhood. And you can see that it has the highest frequency of asthma. And you can see the, the distribution of asthma is sharply divided. The red line neighborhoods have the highest frequency. And you see the same pattern for diabetes and high blood pressure and kidney disease. And people in public health know that a zip code is probably a better predictor of health outcomes than genetics or family history. And the social vulnerability index from the ballpark neighborhood is a 0.896 with a 0.9 or one being the highest risk. And you can see how sharply divided that is. And then you can see who is at risk. See how sharply divided 
each of these points represents one of the neighborhoods in either a census district or a redlining district, and they, they overlap. They correspond uh, to the same neighborhoods. And the consequence of life expectancy, you can see an inverse relationship. And so then this map tells us a great deal more, not just the geographic distribution of heat, but the geographic distribution of risk and who bears more risk than others. So we have a tremendous opportunity with this data to identify those regions, <clears throat> those neighborhoods, and work with, with our neighbors to at least reduce the risk of the heat waves we know are coming. And that's my slideshow. I'll let, leave this up. I have a couple of minutes. I'll just let you look at this. Thank you, Rob. Oh, thank you. Laser pointers back home. To discuss public health and extreme heat, our next speaker, I will invite up when I get this situated. Um, please welcome Assistant Professor of Atmospheric Science, Internal Medicine, and City and Metropolitan Planning at the University of Utah, Dr. Daniel Mendoza. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. And I'm glad that all of you are taking a little bit of time on your Sunday to learn about heat and its detrimental effects. I definitely want to thank the previous speakers because they've already started to touch on some subjects. So you're all experts now on health, redlining, and heat. So I just get the easy part. So this is something that really we all unfortunately are too familiar with, right? This is our inversions. There's a view actually from uh, the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. And we have a camera that points towards the city. So we started to think about air quality as one of our largest environmental concerns. But the reality is temperature is, is also something that's very important. And unfortunately, it's something that really does not affect us all equally. So this is going to be something to keep in the back of your mind. I always like to introduce my research team members. We've got uh, researchers from medicine, political science, uh, economics, and also atmospheric sciences, sociology. So we really want to tackle issues in a more holistic way. If we think about environmental exposures, I mentioned, we're all very familiar with air. And uh, here the topic of today is, also, is obviously temperature, but also if we want to think about the environmental exposome, we've got to think about light pollution, water pollution, sound pollution, as well as food accessibility. So that's something that we really need to kind of keep in the back of our minds because we want to look at this holistically. We don't necessarily need to be thinking about this as just one thing in isolation. Really, if I were to put a, sort of a I would say a circle around all of it, it will also be access to healthcare because that is really one of the most important factors to really counteract any of these environmental exposures. I always like to show this. I know we're, we're going to be bouncing back and forth a little bit between air and, um, and temperature, but it's, they're all very related. And this is, um, well, I actually have a live audience. Normally I'm doing this through Zoom. But how many, so this is, these are the filters from my home, from my air purifier. So how many months do you think it took to get from the clean filter to the dirty filter? So show of hands, one month, two months, three months, four months. Okay, it was, it was two and a half months. So I kind of cheated. I wanted to see if I could get two and three. So, um, well, so let's talk about our, I just want to talk about one health impact. I, there's so many of them, but I think we should first talk about cardiovascular health and extreme heat. That's one of the most studied uh, health impacts of heat. So the heart is vulnerable to extreme heat because the, the human body operates within a narrow temperature range. So the answers were actually given away a little bit earlier, but what happens when, there, when we experience too much heat? So basically sweat that's the way that we cool down the reason is the heart beats faster because we want to not cook our internal organs that's essentially what it is and then that brings blood out and then we sweat and that's how we we cool down 
uh, one of the concerns is obviously, as we know, dehydration. And once we get past certain points then, and our body is not able to cool itself, uh, it can shut down and then we have uh, risks of, uh, for example, heat stroke. Now, what makes this more dangerous is when someone already has pre-existing conditions. Imagine you already have heart disease, your heart's already strained. Now, when you're exposed to high temperature, your body won't be able to cool itself. Putting that additional strain, having to beat faster, having to pump more blood out, could be sort of a tipping point. And then when we're looking at very long exposures, now we are thinking about inflammation and blood clotting. So that's when things are starting to get fairly uh, extreme. Now, when we think about vulnerable populations, so groups that we obviously know that, and I'm really glad that, that Rob brought this up, uh, minority groups that are generally located in, in according to the map, less uh, desirable, uh, parts of the city are much more exposed to high temperatures, but seniors as well. And we may be thinking about seniors as, oh, they're in a retirement home or they're in their houses and they're all very happy. But we have to be thinking about the fact that many seniors are actually on fixed income. And that is a part of, if I don't really like to get too much into this, but we've got to be thinking about what's going on in terms of gentrification here in Salt Lake City. So those maps, those red line maps, they're shifting, I would say. So before when we used to talk, and I mean, I came here to Utah in 2014, and we used to talk about the east side and the west side, usually the our primary, then if we wanted to call it, that would either be I-15 or State Street here for Salt Lake City. There's a new term that we're developing, which is the near west side, which is really from State Street to Redwood Road, because the changing demographics there are just so different. And now the what we wanna call the real west side, it's primarily west of Redwood Road. Now what's going on is many people are actually being uh, not able to, for example, pay the taxes, their property taxes, and they're being moved out. So when you have uh, this, this aspect where you have a fixed income and you may have to decide whether you eat or whether you cool your home, well, these are very difficult decisions. So one thing that our team really wants to do is take a look at these problems in a very holistic aspect. So we first look at environmental exposure. In this case, let's look at temperature. We either measure it or model it. Then we look at the impacts on health to then develop an economic model. What is the cost of action or inaction to then drive public policy? What is something that can actually be done to then influence urban planning. And that's a very catch-all term. It's mainly, for example, if we're looking at air pollution, should a highway be built in this location? Should trees be planted in this location? Where's the highest benefit overall? But then after COVID-19 happened and we saw how different, I think that COVID-19 was good in a sense that it showed us the disparities, the differences between the haves and the have-nots because that really showed us, I, I, we've heard the euphemism and it really bothers me when people say essential workers. They were really expendable workers. And so that's when we started to see contagion rates being completely different and I've got a full talk on that, but not for today. How we showed that there was really a seven fold here in Salt Lake City, seven fold contagion rate higher on lower income populations compared to higher income populations. So that's why our focus is on equity. And I'm glad again, um, thanks a lot, Rob. You really helped set this whole thing up, showing how different parts of the community are much more disadvantaged, have so many other uh, pre-existing just disadvantages and are so much more vulnerable. So we want to focus on populations that really may not really be heard, but maybe at a highest disadvantage. This is a map. And again, this is, we're looking at the whole county. So we're looking at all uh, 39 zip codes in Salt Lake County, and we can really see the differences. So expanding on Salt Lake City, this is the whole county. And we can see how disadvantaged the west side is, particularly the northwest side, which really involves the west side of Salt Lake City and West Valley as well. So I wanna jump to some of the positive things that are going on. These are cool centers and Fittingly, it's in the Department of Aging and Adult Services because, again, seniors are some of the most vulnerable populations. Uh, they're much more likely to have underlying health conditions and also have uh, less access to cooling. 
So here, this is a county program, and we can see where the cool centers are. Does anyone know what a cool center is, by the way? Show of hands. Okay, so I'll explain it for the other half. A cool center is essentially a public building, sometimes a rec center or library, and that's where one can go in and try to stay away from the heat during the hottest part of the day. Unfortunately, uh, they have fairly limited hours. They're generally office hours, whatever the library opens. So just to give you a fairly um, overview rundown of this, one of, the one of the main problems is when we're looking at Saturday or Sunday, these cool centers actually close earlier, three, four in the afternoon. That's actually when it's hottest. And that's some of the, of the maps that both Joey and Rob showed. And so that's really not benefiting the community as much. So what we really want to do is to try to understand how can we best serve the community. Uh, and something that's really important is also looking at the, at, at the evening time, because if one does not have central air or a swamp cooler or even a window unit, then the air becomes stagnant. In terms of health, we need to be sleeping below 80 Fahrenheit in, at a, to recover a cellular level. So if our homes are not below 80 Fahrenheit, really ideally below 75, we're not recovering, we're not ready for the next day. There are many, I just showed cardiovascular, but there are um, also many neurological and pulmonary negative impacts of exposure, especially chronic exposure. So I'll just jump right into the results. So we have a project where we have mounted air quality sensors on top of the tracks trains as well as electric buses. It's a collaboration between Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, UTA, DAQ, Hill, Utah, and the University of Utah. And the, the, it's most notorious for the work that we're doing in terms of air quality. However, all our sensors also have temperature so and relative humidity uh, pressure as well. So this is our network. We have them on all three track trains, and we have right now seven buses. So what we did was uh, we wanted to collaborate with the summer heat campaign, and we took some we took some measurements, spoke with uh, UTA to try to get as many of the buses out as possible uh, that day. What I'm going to show are so this is basically a snapshot, just so you can kind of see the coverage that we have. I wanted to highlight July 17th uh, simply because that was two days after the campaign, but that was actually our hottest day. We reached uh, nearly 42 degrees Celsius, which is 106. So we didn't break the record of 107, but we were really close. And this is the 509 bus. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the buses. I try to take buses all the time. So for me, it's like, oh, I know what the route is. But you can see the temperature readings at 9 a.m. and at 1 p.m. And we can see an almost seven degrees Celsius difference. This is within the same hour. We can gather data every two seconds from the buses and also from the trains. So that's why you see it as an almost continuous function there. We get about seven to 10 uh, readings per city block. And a seven degree Celsius difference is basically a little bit over 14 Fahrenheit. Imagine that kind of difference from one side of the city to the other. And this is primarily on the west side because we're really starting just east of 515. That's where the bus depot is. And then the end of the route on the, on the southwest corner is uh, West Valley. What we see here is also a correlation with ozone. So what's going on here is we're getting, and I don't wanna to get too deep into air pollution and all of that, but primarily to have ozone, you need, um, you need sunlight, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, that's, and sunlight catalyzes that. Well, when we don't have an urban canopy, when we don't have that cover, then that means all that sunlight is coming directly into the surface. So what we call tropospheric ozone, which is on the surface, that's what we're breathing. Stratospheric, which is above us, that's, we want a lot of that. That's what's protecting, for example, when we had that hole in the South Pole, et cetera. So, but when we have it at breathing height, that is a problem. It's an inflammatory process, it's equivalent. When you breathe in ozone, it's essentially like having a sunburn inside your lungs. That's uh, the oxidative properties. Um, we already saw a really nice plot here of rising temperature. And again, what we're most concerned about is the nighttime uh, temperatures because if they do not uh, lower, then that means that we need to artificially lower it using generally air conditioning if we have the ability, but we need to be thinking about our neighbors, our community members who do not have access to central air. And this is uh, 
a, a map that we have uh, this network of data called uh, MESAWEST. It's the densest observation network in the world. We have uh, about 60 uh, stations across Salt Lake County, and you can see here Salt Lake City is in blue. We can just see the gradient going from east to west of higher temperatures. So we can definitely see that the west side is much, much warmer uh, than the east side here by about uh, three to four degrees Celsius. Again, generally just double that to get the equivalent in Fahrenheit. If you can see the stations up north there by the Great Salt Lake, obviously you're getting a lake breeze, which you get natural cooling. In addition to having the uh, the east side being at higher elevation, which of course involves having down canyon winds, which are cooler. Uh, what happens is then the heat gets pushed over, similar to the pollution. I did a similar study looking at fireworks when we used to have fireworks through 2019, where the pollution from the fireworks just got shoved into the west side and it persisted there until about 2 p.m. Very similar in a sense to heat. And I really, again, like the map that, um, that Rob showed, because again, we're seeing how the east side is cooler overnight, and that's reflected on the 6 to 7 a.m. readings. We did uh, a few years ago a study on human health and economic cost of air pollution. I think the time is ripe for us to look at uh, the cost of extreme temperature in, in Utah. I think that there's the really substantial issues, primarily when we start to look at the adverse health outcomes and the potential for hospitalization and other uh, negative, just overall having lower productivity. That's some of the work that's been done. And I actually, I think I saw a poster about it. Yes, the heat risks for uh, outdoor workers. So we do have a colleague that works on that primarily. He's looked at, for example, the impact on the World Cup and what happened to the workers there in Qatar. That's obviously very extreme. We're not at that point yet. Hopefully don't get there, but um, climate models have been, showing us that uh, we'll be getting to Las Vegas climate in about 2040. So that's uh, that's something for us to really be concerned about. And that's why we work with a lot of UNLV uh, researchers, because they're already tackling issues such as water scarcity and elevated temperatures. They're ahead of the curve. So lots of collaborators and contributors and happy to take any questions afterwards. And that's my email address. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Okay, what's next? Well, to explore looking forward with hope, please welcome Deputy Director of Salt Lake City's Sustainability, Sustainability Department, Sophia Nicholas. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming out on a Sunday to learn about these, these results and what it means. So um, I am the Deputy Director of our Salt Lake City Sustainability Department. We are, um, we have about 60 total staff. Uh, most of those are in our Waste and Recycling Division. And then there's about 11 of us that are in our Policy Division, that's our Energy and Environment Division. We work on climate, renewable energy, air quality, food equity, and outreach. So a lot of the same things that you've, you've seen here um, on these slides. And I just want to thank, again, everyone who's been involved. This really was a, a collaborative effort. Um, Dr. Dr. Zhang, um, who received the, um, was our primary um, applicant, received the, the grant from NOAA brought together a really truly fantastic group of collaborators on this project and, and from the very beginning it's been a, a collaborative effort so just want to thank everyone um, involved in that project team and as well as all of the re, uh, volunteers that really helped us undertake the assessment so the city is doing um, a lot it's it's kind of interwoven in a lot of different programs um, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of those, but I do want to to hit on a few of the uh, current and, and upcoming um, topics that are that are most relevant to some of the research today. So trees, I think this is this is the biggest thing that uh, the city has has known is is a priority um, ever since our our founding, really. 
And, um, and, and I, you know, I was at least heartened somewhat in the results that we received showing that the, the urban forest really does play such a significant role in mitigating those, those heat and the impacts on the temperature that we saw throughout the day. Um, it matters, planting trees, caring for trees, investing in our green infrastructure truly matters. So some of you may or may not know we have both uh, private trees, so the trees in your backyard, your front yard, your side yard, and then we have pub, uh, public trees. So Salt Lake City maintains an urban forest of 90,000 public trees. These are in our parks, our golf courses, other public spaces, medians, as well as in our park strips. So park strips, for those of you who don't know, is that area between the sidewalk and the road. And that's, that's so core to delivering on um, some of the, uh, uh, the needs that we've seen from this data. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about caring for trees um, in a few slides, but uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that, that this is something that the city has been doing um, for, for quite a long time. And all of the trees that we have in this valley, uh, most of them really are here because of people, because people have planted them and taken care of them over, over decades. So uh, the city has typically planted 1,000 new trees per year. Um, over the last four years, Mayor Mendenhall, when she came in, um, she uh, recognized that we needed to do more. So she had dedicated resources to, to doubling that with the other 1,000 being planted on the west side. And uh, we've done that for the last four years. So I don't have a separate slide for this, but I wanna talk about our urban forest action plan. How many of you have heard of that? Great, well, that's more than I would have thought. Um, so one of the things that the city can do um, is we have uh, uh, regulate, uh, authority over land use, uh, which is one of the primary ways that the city um, can help shape development and, and, and policy and ordinance. So um, last year, the, the, the city council adopted a, an urban forest action plan for the first time. And this is really exciting because it's used as a guide when there's rezones, um, when there's um, um, new plans that are that are coming into effect, when there's uh, departments that are looking for budget to do to, for projects to support urban urban trees. And I, I just got this update from our planning director, so I'm going to cover a, a few highlights of, of what this adoption has meant over the last year. So he said it's helped us establish new street tree regulations including adequate soil volumes in the downtown area. It's helped provide guidance on updating our um, landscaping requirements related to how tree canopy is counted towards our required vegetation coverage. And um, to Rob's point, this urban forest action plan has provided guidance in establishing new zoning requirements and re regulations around the ballpark track station that will provide more space for public and private trees, and finally, in the last year, it's used as a it's been used as a justification to require new subdivisions to consider street trees as public infrastructure, and therefore um, um, supports the requirement that more trees are installed. So that's great news. I was I was really really happy to hear um, that that had 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 that many impacts just in the last in the last year. Now we're going to talk about the Green Loop. How many of you have heard of the Green Loop? Oh, very exciting. So um, I'm, I'm focusing on this in part because it is one of the, we're very um, excited about it in the city and it's also, there's a public comment that's open right now through the, the month of November. And I think it's, it's one of the ways that the city is looking at how can we um, address these multifaceted issues. Um, Salt Lake City for the most part, except in the Northwest Quadrant is largely built out. Um, however, we do have, um, we are blessed with wide roads, for better or for worse, depending on your perspective there. Um, but the, the, the Green Loop is, is looking at how we can reimagine some of our, our downtown um, roadways. So, uh, and this, was, this has been part of city plans for, for uh, at least a decade, if not more. So the, the Green Loop is envisioned to ultimately be um, an area from North Temple over to Second East, connecting with the Nine Line on 900 South, and then going up on either 500 West, uh, 500 or 600 West. 
So this is uh, some of the project vision. Um, uh, we're looking to add a lot more trees downtown. We've seen the impact of these uh, heat islands that are caused um, are, are exacerbated by those those um, hot temperatures and, and with our asphalt and a lot of uh, concrete. The guiding principles uh, develop a robust downtown urban forest, serve as an active transportation corridor for walking and biking, improve water quality through stormwater management. Uh, we're getting those rain events that are coming um, in much heavier doses, uh, but less frequently. And then creating inviting social spaces that can serve uh, residents and visitors downtown. So right now, uh, less than 30% of downtown is within five minutes of walking space from open space. And as we're seeing a lot of development, a lot of development in our downtown core, a lot of density in our downtown core, this is, um, um, we recognize the, the need to improve access to those green spaces for, for residents and visitors downtown. So if and when fully realized, the green loop would um, mean that 60% of the downtown area is within a five minute walk from open space. So here's just a, a little visual here. Um, this is Second East looking north as it currently stands. This is a, a concept of how that could be enhanced uh, through the Green Loop. So um, we have, uh, you, you can't really see it, but uh, to the right of the screen is the um, still two-way traffic. It would just go down from being uh, uh, five lanes currently to two lanes. And then you can see a lot of you know, space, raised, raised pathways for, for biking. We've got our uh, multi-purpose space there that can change during the day as well uh, for people to kind of sit and eat uh, meat. And then at night, it could also be used for public um, performances or events or whatnot. And then we've got our trees, of course, and our, um, our urban our, uh, uh, plants that are helping with um, also reducing the heat as well as uh, just generally beautifying our city. So there's a lot of different concepts. I encourage you to go to their website. Um, we have, we're gonna have some links um, at the end of this presentation as well as uh, we might have something at our table. But this is just one example of um, one of the design concepts for Second East. Uh, you can see that the larger circle is the existing trees and the smaller green circles are new trees. So you can see that we're really looking to dramatically expand the number of trees that are part of um, that are part of the, the 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 green loop, and I'll just say before I get to the next slide, uh, this is something that we've had funding in 2023 to to study and 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 to create a robust design around, um, which has been fantastic, and they've done a fantastic job. So the survey again will be open through the month of November. Um, design and engagement is the first phase. We don't yet have implementation funding for any of this quite yet, so we're kind of working to build that out. So, uh, cool surfaces. So this is this is something that um, some cities are much further along with than Salt Lake City, but we have started to pilot um, a few areas to test these different treatments. So this is um, a picture of an, an alleyway. Uh, on the right there, it's it's had an application of a cool. Um, a, a, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's a cool surfaces treatment. And um, it's it's a lot lighter colored than it is uh, typically with that black asphalt. And then um, this is an infrared camera that we went out afterwards and got a reading. It's still 110. Um, this is just a picture of, of me. I, I didn't do the, all of the application. I just did some for the photo op, but <laughs> had to throw that in there. Um, we also put this on a uh, on a median in, in Sugar House that we could that we could uh, uh, test. So, this is the infrared side by side. Um, the the infrared you can see um, the untreated surface is 128 degrees, and then this the uh, uh, application of that cool cool seal is 110. So it's still really hot. It's still hot, but it's it's better. So. Um, the, there's a lot of testing that needs to be done just in terms of how how uh, much wear and tear, how uh, durable the product is. It's not designed for really heavy use uh, roadways. It's really more for um, your byways or your trails or your alleyways or whatnot. So um, 
we would like to do more of that testing to see if we can expand the application. It's also it's also more expensive. It's about three times more expensive.
Okay, hopefully you all had a chance to answer that first question on the Mentimeta. Um, another one's coming down the line, it sounds like. So what we're gonna do now is invite our speakers back to the front and they'll be here in these chairs. Sorry to some of you on this side who might not have the best visual of them sitting, but I promise you'll hear them. We'll have a mic. Um, and Jude's gonna be walking around with a microphone. So if you've got a question for any of our speakers today, um, think of it now and Jude's gonna run around and we'll try to get in as many as we can before we hit 3.30. And then looking ahead when 3.30 hits, we'll thank you again for joining us. And then in the back, uh, there are some wonderful student posters that high schoolers from um, Roland Hall put together that you can look through. And our community partners are over here on the side of the room to speak to. Um, and then we'll also have a, a TV monitor that we bring out with an interactive data map where you can look through the heat report, uh, zoom in on your neighborhood, your home, um, whatever you'd like to do. That'll be another interactive that happens after we wrap. So speakers, please come back up here and join me in way. It would be wonderful if you could, um, wonderful if you could come join us up here as well. And if you've got a question, get your hand up and we'll see who, who's fastest. <laughs> Here, I'm gonna, I'll pass this up. Yeah, so if you have any additional comments, not answering our poll, but just wanna fill in the blank on that Mentimeter, the next question is open for you to fill out. Thank you all. That was I, I learned so much, and I and I appreciate all of the hard work that went into uh, giving presentations to us. Um, Rob Wilson, I was particularly struck by the heat island that uh, the University of Utah Central Campus is, um, and I also was struck by the either reporting that the um, the breezes that we enjoy on the east side then push that heat that's generated on the from the um, Utah Central Campus, further west onto neighborhoods that are already suffering from debilitating heat and do not have evening um, cooling to um, heat further, so it's exacerbating the issues that they are facing. Can any of you speak to kind of maybe some of the work that you're doing or collaboration with the University of Utah to perhaps uh, mitigate the heat that their campus is generating? Um, and maybe what were some of the causes of the spike in heat that we are kind of adjacent to right now. Thanks. So the causes, I think, are <clears throat> that region of Central Campus has some huge parking lots. And it was sort of probably 60s and 70s area era campus expansion. Um, it's near the open union student union and who knows, maybe there are some uh, university employees here who know about this. So that was my interpretation that these, you've got a lot of impermeable surfaces. And I don't think I made that as clear as I could in my presentation that the heat island effect is caused by these impermeable surfaces. Uh, being impermeable, water runs off and doesn't absorb in, so they don't have water to evaporate. They're not evaporative surfaces, and it's that evaporation that causes the, the evening cooling especially. So it's a lack of impermeable surfaces. Uh, this is something that, again, it's a little bit of speculation of why I think there may be higher temperatures within the university. Uh, we have a fairly high density of buildings. They're all air conditioned. And so what happens if, you know, for example, right outside your air conditioning, it's pretty warm, right? And your refrigerator is the same thing. So that's the suspicion that I have. Also, there's a lot of medical equipment uh, that we have a lot of, for example, in terms of in science, we have a lot of helium. So those tanks have to be super cooled. So as you're cooling that, then that means that there's uh, heat that's being radiated. And also in terms of medical equipment, there are also some gases that are needed, uh, compressed oxygen, for example. So all of that, as it's cooling, then it has to radiate some heat. Again, speculation, I'm not speaking for the youth, it's just what just happened with a wonderful question because I was also looking at the map and wondering why that was going on. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, so could you guys comment at all about the Great, Great Salt Lake water crisis and that, what kind of impact that has, or are you going to include that in studies going forward in terms of how that affects our overall heat up or down? Sure. So my group has done a, a study to study the, how would the water area in the Great Salt Lake would impact the local precipitation. Um, so we did a set of experiments by using regional climate models um, to look at different scenarios. For example, it's the level in the 2014 and it's 100 percent, 50 percent of that, that the water area, 25 percent or it totally gone. So what we find is that, that this dramatic impact of um, gray solid area on local precipitation. Um, so um, Dr. Rob Guinness is also the co-author. So we, we wrote a paper, we submitted to a journal, it's under review right now. So what we find is, is that yes, the, the, uh, it's kind of to trigger negative feedback. So basically that uh, the less the lake area is, uh, the big impact it will be in reducing precipitation receiving the gray solid lake basin. Um, so that, that's basically what we have found right now. I guess other uh, other impacts are associated with dust, and dust obviously dust storms like the experience in Arizona. You know, our storms are becoming more intense, and more of that dust is being released uh, and transported over to the city. Another aspect, of course, is that the, all the heavy metals that are actually in the Great Salt Lake are now available to be transported. Uh, that's it. <laughs> To my knowledge, it hasn't been measured, but the evaporative cooling effect of the lake um, would cool its uh, the, the air above it and the surrounding land. So as the lake shore recedes farther away from the city and you have dry lake bed, you're not gonna get any cooling effect. You're gonna get something more like the impermeable surface effect of the heat islands. And this is just my um, reminder about uh, as we as we're entering an era of, of, of climate change impacts on our community, we're we're seeing water scarcity, drought, and certainly you know heat as some of the the um, biggest uh, impacts we're, we're we're facing right now, both at a personal level, residential level, and, and then certainly at a city planning level. So, um, again, water conservation so important. It helps with our lake, it helps with our reservoir storage, um, but let's water our trees uh, so that we can uh, not sacrifice our community in, in the meantime. I think we have another question right back here. Hi there. Hi there, Amy Hawkins. Um, I'm chair of the Ballpark Community Council. So Rob Wilson, thank you very much for highlighting some of the structural disparities that we experience in our neighborhood. Um, I have two questions or points. Uh, the first is that some of these neighborhoods that have this, this distinct urban tree disparity, uh, disparity in our urban forest here in Salt Lake City, are also extremely tilted towards renter majority. For example, the ballpark neighborhood is 85% um, renter occupied versus 15% owner occupied housing. And that presents a real challenge in um, the logistics of getting those trees watered. And I look forward to hearing about the city's strategies to address that, uh, especially as we continue to see increased density of multifamily housing in those areas. Um, the second is that uh, another cost that didn't come up, uh, a disparity, and, and I wanted to bring this to the attention of, of researchers who are thinking about how to frame this research, is um, we know that it's a national, if not an international phenomenon, that violent crime goes up as, as heat goes up. And so I wondered if it would be helpful to think about framing in terms of social justice, the disparity in urban heat islands, also in terms of the, the difference in, in crime that we see east-west across the city. I'd love to hear folks' thoughts on either of those points. 
Thanks for being here, Amy. Um, is this on still? It's okay. Um, yes, I know that, that, that that's uh, in part why the Urban Forest Action Plan was, um, it, it, trees encompass so many benefits and, and the recognition around uh, reduction of violent crime is certainly a part of um, one of the reasons that the city is trying to prioritize more urban forest. Um, I think that the, the challenge of um, watering trees is the, the very real one we're, we're dealing with across for many reasons and the you know renter um, population uh, you know could be part of that. Um, I don't know that there's an easy answer, a great answer to that. I don't think it's likely that the city is going to have the ability to water our trees any, anytime soon on the scale that we really need to. Um, there might be some um, um, solutions for priority areas that we can explore and I think our, our urban forestry team has been exploring those but um, yeah would love your thoughts on that I think it's it's a real challenge um, in, in places especially where we don't have um, um, irrigation built in to some of these old trees so I, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts to share I'll respond to the question about um, violent crime going up so uh, my class was interested in the effects of heat on mental health. And I asked a psychology teacher at my high school about this, and she described to me the frustration violence principle. And um, it's a principle in psychology where there's a person experiences something that they can't control that's not what they want. And, and the frustration builds and leads to temper tantrums or violent outbursts or criminal behavior. Um, and that seems to explain in part the increase in crime you see during heat waves. And then corollary to that is what we are learning about the effects of environment on mental state and the benefits of being in natural environments on mental state and mental function. Um, and I have recently discovered the concept of forest bathing. And no, you're not taking a shower in the woods. It's, it's being exposed to the sights and sounds and smells and I'd say probably natural chemicals of forest. And I think the or urban forest can satisfy that more readily because it's accessible to so many people so conveniently. One small thing I wanna add to this, I was actually just reading an article about this this past week in the New Yorker. It was discussing, uh, well, so part of the work that I do my affiliation with City Metropolitan Planning is I direct a program, the Dark Sky Studies Minor, where we look at light pollution and associated impacts, uh, but also work on sound pollution. And one thing that maybe not a lot of us are thinking about is the fact that uh, urban forests actually muffle sound. So that's something that, again, is a substantial stressor. Uh, lots of studies have been done in terms of sound pollution, for example. Uh, so I used to live in Chicago, and, there, and then we have the L, which is the elevated train, so it's like our tracks, but up higher, and people who lived on those apartments, essentially almost touching the L, uh, they were exposed to, on average, about uh, 10 to 30 higher decibels each day. Exactly. I used to do theater, so it's okay. <laughs> um, so having that uh, elevated amount of decibels it increased uh, the risk of uh, heart attacks by about 30 percent. So being able to reduce sound pollution is something else that is really a great benefit of urban forest and just a more positive structure in terms of how you live. It, I did not know that the, that the rate of rentals is so high that it's 85 percent in that neighborhood. What that means is that those residents are powerless to enact any change. So that's something that then we need to consider because it may be that landlords would not allow specific things. So for example, if I wanted to, I could plant trees all around my house. But if I'm a renter, first of all, the space is constrained. There are common areas uh, that, and those are actually run by whoever owns the building or the home. So we need to be thinking about, and this just really adds on to what Rob just said, the feeling of being powerless which then causes people to act out because it does affect mental health. So we need to be thinking about what control one has in terms of their own environment, because that could be a really good predictor of what could be some outcomes. Actually, Rob stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to talk about that.
All right, are we ready for another question? Okay, we're gonna take one more. I see a hand back here. I think this is more for Nicole, right? Oh, Sophia, sorry. I don't know how I got Nicole. <laughs> anyway, I, my name's Constance Smith. I live in Sugar House. One of the things that I would love to see is the communication about watering trees. Uh, I had a neighbor who left uh, Salt Lake for the summer, and I called her and said, your trees on the park strip look sick. And she had an arborist come, and he said, well, they're not getting water. And we're so used to them just getting water naturally. But I thought, well, if maybe it would go out when our tax notice, because everyone looks at that, at least you would think. But other things I think would, you know, we just need some communication to people. It's that old thought process that those trees just naturally get groundwater. And we're, our groundwater is getting so diminished. So there's got to be communication about, and then the people who, who make a waterwise park strip, but then they've got this big tree, so then they don't water it. So it's such a, a difficult, um, you know, tightrope. And I wish we could get that out to people that their trees still need water. So anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. That's exactly what we need to do. That's why we're here talking about it. We uh, and why the, the Keep Your Cool campaign started. So um, there are a few yard signs in the back there at our table, as well as hats and shirts and stickers. And uh, definitely encourage you uh, to take those if you'd like. And then uh, you can also go online and um, perhaps I believe you can even request some of them. So uh, thank you for helping us spread the word on that. We're going to take one one more question. I, I Let's was misrepresenting. Do it. Okay, um, I'm gonna take this gentleman right here. Thank you, my name is Richard Holman. Uh, I'm a community advocate and founder of the Westside Coalition. Um, one of the things that is, is going to devastate the West Side is the issue of increasing temperature as it impacts a socioeconomically deprived community, six communities. They have to purchase air handling units. They also have to pay the monthly bill associated with cooling. And as temperatures go up, we're forcing those people either out of their homes into cooler environments, and that exacerbates the gentrification, or we find a way to augment through government agencies or to the city some way to increase the air handling capacity of those older homes and be able to augment the, the cost of cooling. Uh, I'd welcome any thoughts on that. Yes, and, and one of the things that um, I'm, our team is very busy working on is a lot of this funding that's coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act right now, right? So the historic climate legislation that was passed last year by Congress um, thankfully, right, we, we finally have some money, <laughs> some real money. It's not, not, not enough, but it's, it's some real money to start tackling these and other challenges as it relates to climate. So that gives me a lot of hope in that we can start um, putting money where we need it, especially with those who are most vulnerable. Um, and, we're, and we're required to as part of uh, a lot of this federal funding. Um, there's, there's a requirement that 40% of the federal funds go to benefit those exact areas um, in our communities. So cooling systems, uh, rebates, um, energy efficiency, new technologies around uh, uh, helping people who don't have cooling or might have swamp coolers that aren't as effective anymore move towards uh, uh, heat pump technology, which can pro provide both heating and cooling, um, uh, urban f uh, money to support increased urban forest, um, plantings, perhaps a community, uh, uh, expanded communications campaign, um, solar uh, to reduce energy bills for people um, by supporting solar on their homes. Um, so we have we have some programs in the city and in, in county and other municipalities that work on home rehab and home repair. Uh, there, there, there's a lot more demand than we have funding for. So um, we are doing some of these already, but we need to do more. Um, and then we need to look at the community level, right? So cooling centers, um, 
more uh, more trees, of course, more, I, I put the ideas in, in that in that uh, survey because I'd really love to hear everyone's thoughts on, on kind of what they're, what they're seeing in their neighborhoods, what they'd like to see more of and, and any other ideas you have. But uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities now uh, with, with, with this money that's just really starting to get rolled out through states and cities and communities and, and academic partnerships and nonprofit partnerships. So, uh, Keep, keep your ideas coming in, and thanks so much for all you do and all your collaboration. And I'd like to underscore the importance of, of access to air conditioning or cooling of some sort, because um, if you recall in my slide, that showed social vulnerability, and it showed the distribution of, of asthma and cardiovascular disease and other. Well, um, people at greater risk of heat-related illness are younger people, older people, and people with underlying health conditions. And so if, if you have underlying health conditions and you don't have access to a cool area, like you can't afford a, an air conditioner in your home, then it, that amplifies your risk of a negative health outcome. One thing that I think is critical is the is conveying education. So this is why we're really appreciated the fact that you all took time out here and we hope that you discuss with your neighbors, with your friends and try to spread the word about this because the first step is really education and learning about these concerns, particularly for many of the underserved communities. We've done some work, obviously my main my main focus areas, air pollution, and there are many studies that show that for English learners and recent arrivals to Utah, it takes three to five years longer for them to understand the importance of air pollution and its impacts on health. So first, we really need to make sure that everyone is aware that extreme heat is not normal, it's not healthy, and that there are opportunities and access to cooling centers or to other resources. I think that that is the first part, because if you don't believe that it's a problem, and many people, for example, one of the hardest uphill battles that we've had is uh, discussing and showing everyone that summertime ozone is a problem, because it's invisible. We don't see ozone. We see the inversion, so it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, that's really bad. I'm going to try to hide from that. But many people we see, everyone goes hiking, and the higher in elevation you go, the higher the ozone, but people don't really know that, and they think, oh, I'm really safe. A lot of my friends, for example, have moved to Park City, or people that I know, everyone's like, oh, we'll get away from the pollution. No, it's actually going to be much worse during the summer. So things like that, and now talking about heat, many, if we think about many of the immigrant populations who come here, they come from much uh, warmer climates, so they think, oh, it's completely normal, I'm used to it. But it is just, just look at life expectancy in some of these countries. So what we need to be thinking about is how do we educate community members, particularly some English learners and some vulnerable uh, populations that may not be aware, and then try to give, uh, try to provide resources. Cooling centers is a great step. Trees, uh, for example, are a great sort of systematic way to provide these amenities, to provide some cooling relief, and then just really work with the communities. and. I definitely appreciate all the work that Richard and Westside Coalition have done in trying to really bring some equity to the table because the disparities, the socioeconomic disparities that we're seeing are just getting substantially worse. I just want to add that um, Utah State University recently received three million grants from USDA Urban Forestry Program to bring trees to 90 communities uh, in Utah, and in, in particular those underserved communities. So the, the project PI is Danina Hirschberg. So Danina couldn't be here, because she, she planned to be here, but her daughter has an emergency. So she's the project leader, I'm the co-PI. So we, we wrote a proposal to use the Urban Forestry Program this summer, and we just got results from the USDA that it's funded. So we are gonna do plan chase in Utah uh, over the next three years, collaborating with an NGO called Chi Utah. So it's uh, a great opportunity for us to increase the uh, green infrastructure in Utah, particularly Salt Lake City, the western side. Um, so that is great news um, for Utahns to have more trees to mitigate urban heat. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. 
in starting this conversation with us. Please know that it will continue and you are a crucial part of that. I encourage you all to explore some of these posters, talk with partners. Please feel free to stay in this room and talk with um, each other and, and with the rest of us that are in here. Um, and an and invitation to join us back here at the Natural History Museum um, next weekend when Climate of Hope, the exhibit just out these doors is open. Uh, we'll be thrilled to have you back for that. Um, please join me one more time thanking our wonderful speakers for today. Thank you.